Okay. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 13. Huh? You still got the prayer list up there? Yeah, I need to put that. There's a lot of slides this morning, too. Uh, Okay. All right. This outline's a little bit different. Like I said, I got several pages to show, and uh, but there's some bases that we need to cover before we dig in too deep. Um, let's begin reading verse one of chapter thirteen. It says, "And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads." the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now I want to stop right there for just a moment. The, uh, this is a, actually, they call, at least I say they, uh, I have heard that these three chapters are sometimes referred to as inset chapters, um, where it's uh, uh, inserted like be between the seven trumpets and then the seven vials or bowls of God's wrath. I don't know that I would call them inset. Um, it is covering some detail that uh, would apply to what we've already looked at thus far in Revelation, particularly ch chapter 12. 12, 13, and 14 go together. And John had just got through um, saying in chapter 12, if y'all remember what that was about, there was the dragon that was uh, uh, going to uh, try to kill the man-child. There was a woman who was pregnant with child, and the dragon was going to kill it. dragon couldn't kill it. Uh, the man child was called away into heaven, so he turned his, his attention to the woman, and the woman was preserved uh, through God's power and through God's strength, and then he turned to the seed of the woman, those that have the testimony of Jesus. And that's how it ended, uh, that, uh, that says the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of his Christ. Now, this is going to give us detail as to how that dragon is going to go after the seed. What's going to happen? What is he going to do? What does it mean uh, by making war against the remnant of our seed? This is what 13 is about. Uh, it goes, he says that he uh, uh, saw this beast. Uh, the, the similarities are, are very nearly identical. To the dragon. Now I'm going to say this now ahead of time before we get to it, but I might have to repeat it later. It's, it's important to understand that you cannot separate the kingdom from its king in these prophecies. Uh, they go hand in hand. Just like Jesus, his church is his body. His church is inseparable from him. Uh, and, and he from his church, uh, he, he died on the cross. He, he bled and died and gave his life for his church, we're told. And it's his body. Uh, the a kingdom is, is much the same way. And remember, Satan is, is all about trying to. Uh, oh, he, he's an imposter in many ways. Uh, and uh, so we have to bear that in mind when we're looking at this. The dragon, it says in chapter 12, is indeed Satan. It says that. But it also says that this dragon has seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. Now, it just said that in 12. Now, in 13, he sees a vision where he's standing on the sea and he sees this beast come out of the sea uh, which, which has seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns on the horns. That's very similar, just slightly different. The difference is one is named to have seven crowns on the heads and the other is 
to have 10 crowns on the horns. Now, I don't know, I can't tell you, I know for certain the significance of that. I can tell you, I, 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 there's, I mean, there is an explanation that I can bring forward that could explain it, but I'm not gonna stand firm on that either. But uh, there's a lot of imagery here that we, we're not going to, we're probably not going to understand completely until the time comes, until we see these things unfold. Um, now, uh, he goes on to tell us that, uh, oh, I'm looking at the wrong spot, looking at 10, wondering what's wrong. That this beast, it says, is likened to a leopard and feet like a bear and mouth like a lion. And the dragon is what gave it its power. Now, those, na those animals are significant. And they're there for a reason. And I'm thinking that anybody, especially John himself, anybody that knows uh, the prophet Daniel would know with what to associate this dragon. Because it's, uh, excuse me, this beast. Because it's, it's uh, uh, personified by these animals. Now, uh, the interesting thing is uh, also that it is called a beast. Now, uh, it's not the same kind of a beast that is at the throne of God, those four living creatures. It's not that kind of a beast at all. It's a different Greek word. Uh, the Greek word here means a wild animal, an animal that's, that's uh, not tamed, an animal that's not being controlled. An animal that takes on a, a will of its own that it's so powerful. And, and it's, it's, uh, uh, it's like a wild animal. And um, the, uh, so the, the, the question becomes, what is this beast? What, why is it so closely associated to the dragon in chapter 12? Why the seven heads and the ten horns? Why the seven crowns on the heads? And why the ten crowns on horns? And that sort of a thing. To understand what we're going to read this morning, it's imperative to understand what's in the prophet Daniel. Uh, particularly, it starts with chapter 2. And the reason it starts with chapter 2 is it shows a succession of kingdoms. And it does so in, in such a way that, that uh, uh, we understand that it, they were looking at one system. Uh, let me go ahead and tell you what it is. So I, I'm not going to go there and read. Uh, we might read some of seven, but uh, chapter two, I'll just tell you, you probably are familiar with it. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. This was during the exile when uh, the children of Israel were brought uh, out of their land and they were brought as captives as exiles into the kingdom of Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar the king had a dream and he knew this dream meant something because it was it was one of those dreams that's just too vivid and too articulate to not mean anything to just be something that he ate that night maybe he had some pizza but that is too much of a significant dream to be that so he knew it meant something, so he sent word out to his seers, his wise men, and said, if someone can tell me what this dream means, you know, they'll be rewarded. So, of course, anybody can come up with something and, put, and you know, give an explanation and say, well, this means that, that means this. And uh, uh, most likely, always, these seers, uh, they always have good news for the king anyway, no matter what. And, uh, but the king said, uh-uh, not so fast. They wanted to know what the dream was so they could tell him, and he said, uh-uh, not, that's not how this is going to work this time. You have to tell me what the dream was, and you have to interpret it, or I'm going to have you all killed. So that's, that was serious. And so um, word got to Daniel because Daniel was a type of a seer in that land. And so Daniel gets together with his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they pray and they fast, and uh, they ask God for an interpretation. God gives Daniel the interpretation, and he goes before the king and tells him, I know your dream. And he tells him what the dream was. And the, what the dream was, was a figure, a statue. 
And on the head was the head a golden head, and it had arms and chest of silver, and it had a, a, a midsection of brass, and then it had legs of iron, and then at the and then it had feet that was made of iron mixed with clay. And then there was a stone that was not cut by human hands that struck the feet of that statue and it all came crumbling down. And that stone grew into a mountain and filled the whole earth. That was his dream. If I had that dream, I'd be saying, that's got to mean something. You know, I would say that too. But that was the dream. And Daniel told it to Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar said, yep, you're right. That's the dream. Now, what does it mean? So he tells him, you are that golden head. But again, understand, we're not talking about Nebuchadnezzar specifically, but his kingdom, Babylon. So again, when we think of these things, we must not separate the kingdom from its king. Uh, they're almost interchangeable. So he tells them that you're that golden head. You are a king of kings. And... Um, then after you is going to come a kingdom that's going to be weaker. Now notice that each successive kingdom has less value, but it is stronger because silver is stronger than gold and brass is stronger than silver and iron is stronger than brass. Um, so it gets stronger with each time, but it also becomes less precious and less valuable. Um, but at any rate, he tells him that the one that comes after you is going to be uh, less powerful and less glorious uh, in, in, in strength and in and, and, and glory. And, and then after him is going to come another kingdom. And then after him, another. Well, what we understand and what we know about this is the kingdom that came after Babylon was the Medo-Persian Empire. That would be represented by the silver. Uh, the arms and the, and the chest. And then the next kingdom that came after that was Alexander the Great's kingdom, the kingdom of Greece. And that would be the uh, brass uh, midsection. And then uh, the kingdom that came after that, that was replaced by that, was the kingdom of Rome. Uh, and it did, and it says that it was powerful and it just break into pieces, everything that come in its path. And we do know this about Rome. It, Rome was a very powerful nation and wherever they went they conquered and um, but it says the feet was iron mixed with clay and uh, it didn't uh, it, it, it even though there was the strength of iron present there was the, the presence of clay as well and they didn't mesh together they didn't cohere and for that reason once the feet crumble, the whole thing crumbles down. But this, what this is, is successive kingdoms that happen uh, over that land, over the people of Israel. Um, when you understand that, and you understand how these things are, are counted and how they're, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're viewed, as far as prophecy is concerned, you begin to understand this a whole lot better. But I want us to also turn to Daniel chapter 7. I would love to read this whole chapter, but for time's sake, I'm not going to be able to. Um, this is after King Nebuchadnezzar had died. It says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. And uh, then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. And four beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and uh, made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. Now this is alluding to what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, interesting thing is after that vision of the golden head and Daniel telling him, you're the golden head, well, he decided it would be a great idea to make a golden idol and force everybody to worship it. I don't, that's, you know, I don't know what happened there, but uh, Nebuchadnezzar at some point was humbled by God 
and was made to live as a beast in the field for seven whole years. And after that was over, he gave glory to God. And um, uh, that's what it means by he, he was given a heart like a man. As he had a heart like a beast for those seven years. And um, so it's alluding to that particular thing that occurred to him. And uh, it says, And behold, another beast, a second like, unto, like to a bear. And it raised itself up on one side and had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus to it, Arise and devour much flesh. Now the kingdom that came after Babylon was the Medo-Persians. And it's represented by this bear. And it says one side is higher than the other. Well, the, the Medes uh, were not as powerful as the Persians, but yet they were, they were partners in that, in that reign. And that explains why the bear was higher on one side. The three teeth are three kingdoms that uh, this bear had overtaken before it had overtaken the kingdom of Babylon. Um, it says, uh, And after this I behold, lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now, um, the leopard is represented by Alexander the Great's kingdom, Greece. It had four heads, and uh, uh, Alexander's kingdom, when he died, was passed along to his four generals, and the kingdom was split into those four ways, and that's, that's what's represented here. Uh, it says that, um, and after this I saw in the night visions and behold, a fourth beast doesn't say exactly what this beast looks like. It just says a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth and it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. Does any of this sound familiar? When we go over to Revelation, we're looking at a beast that comes out of the sea. It's like unto a leopard, like unto a bear, like unto a lion. And it, ha uh, and it has uh, ten horns, it's seven heads, but it also has ten horns. It's, it's very similar. And like I'm saying, it, uh, I, I would imagine that anybody that knew Daniel would make that association. It says, uh, And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Now, if we continue, you can keep your finger over there at Daniel 7. We might flip back there. But if you look at, back at Revelation 13, it says that um, he had this beast come out of the sea that was like unto a leopard, a bear, and a lion. <coughs> Uh, and I saw one of its heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast and they worshipped the, uh, the dragon which gave power unto the beast and they worshipped the beast saying who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him uh, and uh, actually I'm getting ahead of myself here this is on the next outline but it's uh, these the if we move down, it says, and he opened his, in verse 6, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. Excuse me, verse 5 is where I'm looking. Uh, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. There was a great mouth speaking great things from this beast. And it's, it's really closely related to what we see in Daniel chapter, chapter 7. And uh, as we read, if we were to continue reading, uh, we would find out that um, a little bit more about what this means. Let's see, we'll probably do this later at a later date because we're not through talking about this beast and we won't be through talking about it until a few chapters later. Yeah, I think, we'll, I think we'll stop in seven right there and we'll, we'll move on. Now, uh, the, the, we're going to continue talking about this beast for a moment. It had seven heads, ten horns. Um, we understand from what we're reading about these beasts that there is a succession of kingdoms. Uh, the first dream of the statue and then this with the, 
with the lion and then with the bear and then with the leopard and then with this other beast that was unlike all the others. Um, we understand there's a succession. Interestingly enough, this beast is mentioned again in Revelation chapter 17. And in Revelation chapter 17, we'll see that there's a, a woman riding this beast. And uh, the, the, we'll talk about what the woman represents later. Uh, it's my opinion that she represents a religious system that is on the back of writing a political system. That's what it appears to be to me. But more detail is given about the beast that comes out of the sea there. And it says in Revelation 17 that those seven heads are seven successive kingdoms. And it even states that, that they're not contemporaneous to each other. They're seven in succession. So one might think, well, what seven? Uh, everything revolves around Jerusalem. It revolves around Israel, the people of God. And I would venture to say it's, a, it's probably a very good, um, uh, I guess you could call it an assumption, that we're dealing with kingdoms that have to do with the people of God. Kingdoms that, that uh, at least at one time or another, came against the people of God or oppressed the people of God. And if we look at it in those terms, well, there is five. And, and those five had fallen. In Revelation 17, it tells us that five of these kingdoms have fallen. And this is during the time of John's writing. So what we get from that is one would be Egypt because they did indeed. They come up against Israel many times. They tried to destroy Israel. If you remember, that's what Pharaoh tried to do uh, very early on, even before they escaped Israel. Uh, he tried to destroy them. There's Egypt. There's Assyria who also tried to destroy Israel who did successfully dominate the northern ten tribes, but they could not overtake the southern kingdom uh, where God was still protecting. Uh, then you have Babylon. We've talked about that already. Medo-Persia and Greece. Those are the five that have fallen when John was making this writing in Revelation 17. And it says one is in that passage. Five are fallen, one is. The one that is, is Rome. And the seventh is not yet come. So that's what those seven heads represent on that beast. It represents seven kingdoms in succession. Five have already fallen. One is at that date when John was writing. And the other is not yet come. Uh, it could get confusing. But Revelation 17 and verse 12 tells us what the ten horns represent. And the ten horns represent ten contemporaneous kings. In other words, ten kings that exist at the same time together. And they have their own kingdoms. Uh, they're not in succession. They're of the same kingdom. They're ten different kings of ten different kingdoms on the earth at the same time. And it says that they receive their kingdoms and power in the time of the seventh kingdom. The kingdom that has not yet come. Uh, We'll, like, I'm not really reading this right now because we're going to go over this again when we get to Revelation 17. Right now we're in 13, so I'm not really uh, going into that many details. So the question also becomes, why the seven crowns on the seven heads in chapter 12 and then the ten crowns on the, ten, on the horns in chapter 13? Why, does, why is there that differ, different, uh, different description being made? Um, I believe that the events being described concern two different time periods. Uh, when you see the dragon that is trying to consume the, the, male, the man child, uh, it's, uh, it's dealing with a time in John's past. And what is in view is not those end time uh, uh, kingdoms, especially the seventh. Uh, but what is in view is the successive kingdoms in, in, in Rome who happens to be in power at the time. Uh, the, in chapter 13, uh, we're looking at the time of the ten kings from within that seventh kingdom. So it would reflect there's, we're dealing with two different time periods, but the same monster. Remember, it's, it's in succession. It was one statue. Even though Rome, uh, excuse me, Babylon is not Medo-Persia, and Medo-Persia is not Greece, and Greece is not Rome, they're in the same figure. They're in the same lineup. 
The, the goal and the purpose and the general makeup is the same because they're in the same body. And whatever the kingdom is being spoken of, I don't know what, in the seventh head, uh, it remains to be seen. Uh, now, some people might even argue and say that, well, that's the Ottoman Empire or that's the Islamic Caliphate. That could be. I'm willing to listen to that. But I don't think so. Uh, but that's a, that's a discussion for another time. Now, when we get back into Revelation 13, we, we see in verse 2 where he speaks of that leopard, the bear, and the lion in, uh, of Daniel 7. Uh, he speaks of uh, a kingdom in verse 3. Uh, he says, I saw one of his heads. Remember, this is the heads are, are kingdoms, uh, as it were, wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered at the beast. What one can derive from that is you have a beast with seven successive kings or kingdom. We know at least six of them have gone now. The Roman Empire is, is no longer exists. Uh, so what, what we're left with in our day and age is one kingdom that we don't, we don't know what it is yet. But one of those that have passed, one of those that have gone, one of those kingdoms that is now dead is going to be revived. And that's the reason why so many people into end time studies uh, believe that there's going to be a revival of the Roman Empire. Uh, which was, would be represented by the feet of iron mixed with clay in that image of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. But um, one of those kingdoms are going to be revived. Which one? We don't know. And uh, it says, And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And uh, they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now remember what we're talking about. We're, we're not talking about a man. We're not talking about a single leader. We're talking about a kingdom, a, a dominion, a rule, an, a, 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 an, an empire even perhaps. But uh, it says that the people, they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. Uh, they worship Satan. They worship that old system. They worship that old scenario. Uh, what does it mean by worship? Does it mean that they uh, held meetings and they sang songs? And no, we got a very wrong idea about what worship is most of the time. And we tend to confuse praise with worship. Although you can, you can worship with praise. They're not synonyms. They're not synonymous with each other. They're not interchangeable. Um, worship is worship and praise is praise. Now, what it's meant here by they worship the dragon, what is meant is they do obeisance unto him. And they value the dragon. The, 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 uh, the, the root word to worship is worth, worth-ship. You're demonstrating what something is worth to you. So these people of this age, whenever it is, it's in our future, are going to value this government, this system, and they're going to value the one that set it all up. Uh, they might not do it directly. They're not going to have a sign up and say, Church of Satan, everybody come in. It's not going to be like that at all. It's not even going to be associated with Satan. Uh, it's going to be a lot more trickier than that. Uh, but you can, you can rest assured it is, it is powered by him. It says that Satan gave this system its power. So it's powered by him. We know this for sure. And uh, they uh, worship the dragon and the beast and say, who is like this? Who's able to make war with him? It's a government. You don't make war with people. You fight people. It's a government that's in, that's in view here. And um, it says, and there was given unto him a, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. Now, um, there's that three and a half years again. It come up in the last chapter. It come up in chapter 11. It comes up, I believe, twice in Daniel. And I can't explain what that means or how it fits. I just can't. But I can tell you that in my mind, it could be a, a sign or a symbol as a... Uh, uh, I don't know what you call it. 
what, something that you would use to line things up. If you know where that 42 months falls in this vision, you know where that 42 months falls in the other vision, you can see where the events, how they relate to each other. If you, if, you know, if you can understand what I'm saying. Um, but at any rate, it says that he has given a mouth to speak great things. Now, by great things, it doesn't mean good things. It means boastful things. It might mean things that people deem good, but that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about great things, magnificent things, things boastful. But it also says that he's going to blaspheme. That's a word that we don't use very much. We don't acknowledge very often. We hear it, but we don't call it out. We don't call it down. We don't uh, call it down. Uh, but we hear it regularly. To blaspheme God is to vilify him. To make him the author of wickedness. The author of something bad. Uh, we hear this uh, we, all of the time. There are, there are so many things that we see on television, on various programs, uh, not necessarily broadcast television. I hadn't seen that in years, but, but uh, what they broadcast on the air. So I don't know what they're doing, but I see things that they're coming out with on Amazon, Netflix, uh, all these streaming services, and they are filled with blasphemy. And uh, it's, uh, it's when they vilify God. I've seen uh, a certain political figures um, the uh, 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 one that comes to mind, Bill Maher. I don't watch him. His, his shows uh, uh, filled with too much garbage. But every now and then, I stumble across a clip that someone has shared on social media, and I'm able to see it. And he's he's famous for trying to vilify God. Many of the evol proponents for evolutions, uh, excuse me, evolution does this very thing. Uh, they and they use arguments like, if there was a God. Why is there so much suffering? As if God is responsible for the suffering. God isn't responsible for the suffering. Sin is. Man is. Satan is. But God is not. God is the one that's trying to deliver us from the suffering. I can't even say. I mean, it, it's, it's how ridiculous it is. But those are arguments that you would hear. And this is blasphemy. That's going to be coming from the leader of this system, of this government. They're not going to do it openly and blatantly, but they're going to try to vilify God, at least the very thought of God. I, I hate to say this, make this connection. I don't mean to, but it just, you know, there is a political party in America that wants to eliminate the reference of God from their platform. And they did it at least once, I know of, and, and, and uh, they put it back in because... Uh, um, uh, there was a lot of flack for it. Uh, who is it? <laughs> they starts with a D and ends with Democrat. <laughs> that's what. That's who it is. But but uh, that, you know they, these they are famously blaspheming God. Another way that they blaspheme God, and another thing that we need to watch and we need to be careful for is how the government is presented as an object of worship. The government is presented as God. The government's going to deliver you. The government's going to help you. The government's going to create this utopian society if we'll just all embrace it. The government's going to make everything better. We need to elect the right people in the office so that the government can do it all for us. That's the mentality that's, that's, that's overtaking everything today. And it is the very, it's the very idea of it is anti-Christian. It's anti-Christ. It's from the pit of hell, from Satan himself, that idea. The government is not the answer for our woes. Uh, the answer for our woes is to repent of our sin and repent of our wickedness and turn to the living God that sent his son to die on the cross for us. That's the answer. It's not the government. It's the government is not something for us to worship. The government's not something for us to adore. But that's what's being promoted, is it not? From the left, the government is the answer for it all to them. And now you can see how easily we could slip right into the prophecies, what John is describing here and what Daniel has described. It says that uh, he speaks great things and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. 
And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Now oh, that's confusing. I thought we were always supposed to win. I thought the saints of God were always going to come out on top. Well, we are. But that doesn't mean we, there's, there's, no pits, there's no pits along the way that we fall into. And uh, this is uh, uh, also, it's important for us to understand that this is also the time, of, it's called a time of Jacob's trouble. And uh, it, it is uh, not just a time uh, when it says saints, it's not talking about just Christians. It's talking about the, the word saint means holy. So it's talking about believers, uh, Christians that are also that are Jews primarily because that's where most of this is going to be going down. But it's definitely going to include all those that have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's what it says in verse 12. Uh, oh, verse 12. In, uh, chapter 12. Wow. <laughs> Got too many things going on in my head, I guess. But uh, he says that uh, he's going to overcome them. But isn't that what that says in uh, uh, chapter 11 uh, that we just read about the two witnesses? That while they prophesy those 42 months, they're not going to be able to be harmed. But at the end of those 42 months, they're going to be overtaken and they're going to be killed. And, and there's going to be rejoicing around the world and that sort of a thing. Uh, it's, it's very similar to that. It says, uh, he makes war with the saints. He overcomes them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So does it include us? If the United States is around at the time, yes. It does. Uh, all nations, all nationalities, all peoples, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. Uh, he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. And here is the patience and faith of the saints. So he's saying it's going to be tough. It's going to be bad. And believers are going to have to be patient. And they're going to have to know and recognize that those people that are killing with a sword, they're going to be killed with a sword. Those people that are putting folks into captivity, they're going to be put into captivity. Just be patient. Uh, the... Uh, and it talks about those that, it says, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Uh, now it says, that there's a qualifier there. It says those that, whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life. Um, we're going to talk more about this, Lord willing, next Sunday. Uh, and like I said, I wanted to get this whole chapter this Sunday, but there's just too much information here. Uh, and again, I only scratched the surface in just the, you know, the 40 minutes or so that I'm speaking on it. But um, he, he gives this as a message of comfort uh, to, to, for, for believers that happen to be going through this uh, to know that there is an end in sight. And um, people often wonder and I've heard it even said, I might have even thought of it myself. Uh, it says that, uh, that he causes the world to, to, uh, to worship him and uh, causes the, 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 the whole earth. And he goes on, he speaks about a mark later. I wanted to speak about that today, but uh, we'll have to do that next time. But, uh, and people often wonder, you know, what if I accidentally, what is the mark? We don't know what the mark is. What if I accidentally get the mark? What then? Do I go to hell? Uh, but uh, it doesn't work like that. Uh, the Bible tells us in John chapter 3, verse 18, that we are condemned already because we have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the state of man. It's the state of men. Uh, now when you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, when you believe that gospel message, He comes into your heart and He lays claim to you. You belong to Him. You are no longer your own. That's what the Scripture tells us. You belong to Him now. And, and uh, 
there's nothing that can separate you from his hand. That's what the Lord Jesus said. We are marked secure until the day of redemption. Amen. Nothing's going to happen to us when we trust in Christ and we believe in him as our Lord and Savior. If a person, let's say hypothetically, if a person, uh, if they believe that mark is a chip or a tattoo or a UPC code or who knows what, uh, no matter what it is, chips and tattoos and uh, those uh, and marks that you put on the skin, that's not what sends people to hell. We're going to hell already. We're condemned already. Amen. You know, it's, it's silly when people say, I just don't see how a righteous God could send people to hell. He's not sending anybody to hell. That's where everybody's going. It's almost as if there's a plane in the air filled with passengers and its engines have gone out and it's hurling toward the earth to be destroyed. And someone's giving you a parachute and you say, well, how dare you destroy everybody on this plane? It's, that's about, it makes as much sense as someone saying that of the gospel, of God even. He's given us a way out. He's given us a way to escape destruction. He's not making the plane go down. The plane is going down. And, and uh, that's, uh, but, but once you belong to him, uh, you're not going to accidentally get this chip and then suddenly you're, oh no, I'm going to hell now. Kind of a, it, 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 isn't, it isn't about this, this type of thing. When it comes to your name being in the Lamb's Book of Life, it rests on one thing and one thing only, and that's whether you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what puts your name down. And when your name is down, you're in his hand. And nothing can pluck you from his hand. That's what the scripture says. So what we're looking at, when we look at these that worship the beast, those that have the mark and things of that nature, are, are quite simply not unsaved because they got the mark. Uh, the mark, well, whatever it is, we're going to talk about that next Sunday, Lord willing. It's not the thing sending them to hell. Uh, it's the fact that they're going to hell that drives them to worship the beast and get the mark. It's because they don't love God and they don't love the things of God. And that's, that's what this is about. Let's go ahead and bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this time together. And we thank you, Lord, for your prophecy. We thank you for your servants that wrote it down, preserved it for all this year so that we could see it today. Help us, O oh Lord, to handle it properly, to handle it with grace. And help us to understand the times that we are in and what these things mean and how they apply to us and what they should do um, in our lives and what, how, this, how these things should be um, kept in our hearts and acted out. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the Lord Jesus, for the promise of, of a brighter tomorrow. We know, Lord, that no matter how bad things get, we know that we have the promise of the Lord Jesus and the promise of the hope of eternal life with you, Lord. We're grateful for this, and we know, Lord, that there are some things, some mighty disturbing things that have happened on this earth, and we know that there are going to be some many more disturbing things, but thank, us, thank you, Lord, for giving us the assurance to know that there's something on the other side of all that that makes all of this pale in comparison. Help us, Lord, to look for your kingdom, and help us, Lord, to anticipate the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's all stand.